It started by hosting private get-togethers with women because she felt nourished by connecting. This was the spark that helped her start her private network for female leaders. Hello and welcome to Season 6 of the Women Printer Asia podcast and I'm your host, Krista Good. My mission is to uncover the stories and strategies of Asian women entrepreneurs in Asia to help you as you navigate your own business journey. Today's episode is with Yolanda Lee, where we talk about walking with fear, how she started her business, embracing imperfection and understanding success from our own viewpoints, being a woman leader and making true connections. Yolanda is the founder and CEO of Uncommon, a private network for female leaders. It is a private vetted space where women from different fields and backgrounds can unite on shared, messy experiences. Yolanda bootstrapped and launched Uncommon in December 2020, and today it has hundreds of members with a growing waiting list. Yolanda is open and warm, and we had such a great conversation about Yolanda's life and business, and even got her to talk about her growing up years in Canada as a child of immigrant parents, and how her younger years shaped her outlook and perspective about her startup. And now, please enjoy today's conversation with Yolanda Lee. Hi, Yolanda. Welcome to Women Printer Asia. Hi, Krista. Thank you so much for having me here today. So, Yolanda, where are you today physically? Physically, I'm at home in my, my office. I'm in Singapore in the East Coast and I'm gradually unpacking some boxes. I've recently moved in here. Is that a new place or where are you actually from, by the way? Yeah, yeah. so it's transitioning. I've been based in Singapore for seven and a half years, actually. But, you know, I was just moving to a new a new house here. So it's like getting settled in. I actually have a pile of books next to me <laughs> that you can't see on camera. So Yolanda, before we get into the good stuff about your life and all that, I want to know what are you doing in Singapore? And I don't think you're Singaporean, are you? I'm not Singaporean, no, no. So, so I feel like after seven and a half years, I, I feel very rooted here. I'm originally from Canada. I'm born and raised in Toronto. And I've, I'm sure we'll kind of you know tell my story a little bit more, but I have spent the last 15 years of living and working kind of all over the world and in 10 different countries and I came to Singapore yeah originally when I was working in tech and and you know helped set up some of some big tech companies here but right now I'm building my startup called Uncommon. Uncommon is a private network for women in leadership. We use behavioral science and coaching to really help female leaders get ahead, help clarify their goals and do so together with a really supportive community as well. So that's really something that was in you that you wanted to build this from the very start or was it something that you saw needed to be started somehow in the market? Oh, I think it's one of those things that, you know, you always can see it in hindsight that it was part of who I was and part of what I stood for at my core. But, uh, you know, going through the process, you don't necessarily necessarily have the idea that, okay, I'm going to launch this business. But it was really gradually, you know, being in a variety of leadership roles in these really fast growing tech companies and getting to a certain level where all of a sudden all the women disappear. And it's incredibly lonely. You're asking yourself a lot of questions that sometimes aren't able to be answered by your peers. And, and I started Uncommon kind of organically out of a need I felt as a, as a female leader to connect with, with women who were really in that same boat and write the playbook for you know, how we get ahead and what it actually means to, to get ahead as well. And what was the first thing that you did to start Uncommon? Oh, it, it, good question. I think I've started to plant the seeds in, in this interest area. So I always led commercial teams and operational roles. But I was always very passionate about inclusion and about you know, being different in the workplace and how to make a workplace work for so many different kinds of people. And I mean that in the, in the broadest sense. So I chaired women at Deliveroo, which was the company I was working at. I chaired that committee globally. I served on an advisory board for an, an accelerator that was trying to improve you know, the number of female founders in their pipeline. 
So I was always kind of like dipping my toes and, and in a way de-risking my decision to work in this space. I'm calling it in its early iteration. It was just a dinner that I hosted once a month. We're not necessarily with the intention of turning it into a business, but in really starting to plant the seeds of that community and understand the needs of, of women like me. So, so it happened kind of very organically through that process of me kind of orienting towards the things that really matter to me. Besides diversity and inclusion, what are the things that really matter to you, Yolanda? Oh, so much, so much. The things that really matter to me, like at my core, I think yeah, I think we have to look back at some, sometimes the, the things that shaped us. I'm a really big believer in education and education as, as the ultimate equalizer. I think it's the most powerful tool for social mobility. And I'm, I'm actually quite saddened by the fact that, you know, formal education ends when we're, you know, and, ends, you know, it, in high school and for some people in university and, and and that when we leave formal education it's kind of our last opportunity to learn together with peers and and so i am really passionate about how do we use lifelong learning to continue to drive social mobility to drive better equity and outcomes and so that is really something that that i'm passionate about out of my own experience like i look at say the women in my family in my, in my generation. My grandmother was an immigrant from Trinidad and Tobago. She was you know, born in a rural village, married at the age of 16, had 11 children, never learned to read and write. And I can see the ways that you know, my mother growing up in Canada had way more opportunities. And myself having immigrant parents who were very focused on education, how that delivered you know, great scholarships and great opportunities for myself to to learn and learn together with really exceptional peers. And so that's something I, I hold very dear to my heart as well. Would you say that formal learning and informal learning are totally different? And what are your thoughts on, on these two types of learning? Ooh, I, I guess to define that, I mean, a formal learning kind of traditionally in the classroom, informal learning kind of being everywhere, like being a sponge and absorbing. I, I use the metaphor for this is like formal learning can be, I don't know if you've ever seen the way that foie gras is made, which is like a, a dish in France, but where you're kind of like force fed a lot, you, you force feed the goose a lot of food until its liver, it's kind of horrific, but until its liver is like completely full. And that's sort of how I think about formal education. I think about the things I learned, it's like you cram so much for an exam. I can't tell you anything about you know, so some of the subjects I, I studied, but so, so you're kind of absorbing all this information and a lot of it's kind of designed around examinations, around writing an essay. Uh, but I think what you've really learned are those like lifelong skills of critical thinking, of meeting deadlines, of, and, and, but, but, and so I think of formal learning as, as kind of how you absorb like that. Now, lifelong learning, informal learning, it's a little bit more, it's not as simple as you just attend, say, a workshop, and then all of a sudden you understand everything. I think it's about planting a seed or and almost having like that Hansel and Gretel breadcrumbs. Like sometimes somebody, I, I will learn something or I'll hear something from one of our members in a core group session, one of their coaching sessions, but that aha moment happens gradually. And how I think a lot about like, you know, as humans, we are always connecting the dots. Our brains are always kind of, you know, letting us connect things that sometimes are outside of different disciplines and learning how to integrate them for ourselves. And so I think that informal learning is this kind of much more gradual process, but it's also a lot more lasting as well. So I, I will think of formal learning each time now as the goose. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know. I was just saying this to someone on my team this this week, and I, it kind of stuck with me. It's like you know, you have all these boot camps and all these courses you can take, and you cram it in. Yeah, right. and then like, how do you actually implement that? Like when you show up to work on Monday, do you really remember it? It's like it's a little bit like going to the gym. It's like you've got to build that muscle gradually and consistently over time. Yeah. Is that the reason why uncommon? was established 
I I would say so. I would say so. I think we exist to bridge the gap between theory and action. You know, we know that we have a massive drop off in women around director level. Like a, a country like Singapore, for instance, you have a pretty even split entry level in professional roles. And by the time you get to the most senior leadership roles, it's your percent. And so somewhere along that goal, we have a huge drop off in, in female leadership. And so, yeah, a, a big part of what I wanted to do was create a space where A, you could kind of embrace this imperfection, but you could also learn consistently and learn together. I think sometimes it can feel like development can feel so individual and, and isolating and you're trying to achieve your goals alone. But I wanted to create something that could let you kind of try something Maybe it didn't doesn't work, but come back to the drawing board each month and continue to build that muscle. So, yeah. how does being in uncommon work? So perhaps you could take us through the process. Yeah. So the process is, is pretty forward. So you can apply or join our waitlist at www.heyuncommon.com, and when they get on to the waitlist, our our membership team will then. Look for a couple of things. At the moment, we're really focused on solving this drop off in women to senior leadership positions. So we we are looking for women who kind of have some years of experience under their belt. So kind of an eight eight plus years of experience. From that, then our members will kind of look at look at your profile. We look for a certain level of community oriented for a growth mindset and for that relevance in the community as well. And, and members will then have an interview with someone on our membership committee, which can either be an uncommon team member or some of our members as well. That interview is really to understand, like you know, your goals, what what success looks like for you, and make sure that we're kind of the right fit on both sides. And, and that element of being vetted is is really important to us because we want every member to contribute as much as they receive as well. And that's what I think really makes the community come to life. From there, we we really treat every member as a bit of an individual. We want to understand, so we do a deep dive assessment when someone joins. We want to understand a little bit deeper on who you're looking to match with. What are your goals? Also, what life stage are you at? I think sometimes for women, the personal and the professional are incredibly intertwined. So you know, if you want to be in a core group with a bunch of also working mothers, you, you can be. Or if you want to be with only founders, you can be. So we really try to use data to ensure that you're then matched into a peer a peer advisory group called a core group, which will kind of serve as your your personal advisory board. And we want those people to be the most relevant to where you're at in this season of your life. So then you're matched into a group with eight other women. We're industry agnostic. We want really to be able to to cross pollinate ideas across industries. And then that group, we also match you with the best coach to to help you kind of achieve your goals. And the goals can really vary. Some people they're just you know looking to get to the the next level in their careers. It's really about performance. Um, other people are looking to, to kind of find a better work life balance. So we, we have a kind of range of goals that core groups are working on, and then from there we work on kind of setting goals consistently, doing key check-ins, and also being able to track that progress and really deepen for you as an individual. How are you moving towards and orienting towards your own compass, which might be quite different from, say, my compass. And so that's kind of the backbone of Uncommon is everybody's in a core group. That you know everybody meets monthly with their their coach and their group. Then we look horizontally across the community. How do we connect all these hundreds of members across different core groups? We then have interest groups. We run you know skills based workshops. Everything from how to how to read a PNL or manage a PNL to you know senior stakeholder management, negotiations, public speaking. We really want our members to have like all the tools in their toolkit. And then also looking at interest groups. So you know we have some for people interested in diversity and AI, you know working mothers and different industry groups as well. well that sounds like a lot. 
Yeah. There's a lot yeah. going so on. It's really like choose your own adventure. So we have some members who are showing up to every community event. We have others that really only have the time for their core group. So we give that degree of flexibility in their, their community as well. Is it now mostly physical or it just is physical and online? How does it work for non, yeah. you know, Singaporeans? Yeah, so it's it's both. It's you know, we really believe in the hybrid world. The hybrid world serves women really well. So we we generally will have all our workshops and sessions virtually, but we also give our core groups the optionality to meet. We do try to localize all of them and to meet in person because there is, you know, that need sometimes for human connection. So that's something we give that degree of flexibility on as well. To me, the vision for the company is to really be hybrid, that sometimes you might just want to meet a member one-on-one for a coffee and you want that option, but then you also can have access to incredible speakers and workshops just to tap in on your on your lunch hour as well, which gives people a lot more flexibility. So, so we do have the best of both worlds. Is there a specific age group that you are looking at or it cuts across the board? In general, our members are from 30s to anywhere up to 50s, 60s. I want to highlight that, you know, I read this on your website, right? Your vision for Uncommon is to create a world where women have the clarity and courage to pursue their own version of success and communicate it authentically and confidently where innovative and courageous women can consistently level up their careers, launch and scale big ideas with a solid base of female leaders who will cheer them on. I'm sure there's a story behind this. Yeah. Yeah, do you want to elaborate on that? Because I think that's really a very interesting vision. Yeah, I think it comes like down to, I think especially the pandemic helped me to see what what success means to each individual can be very different. And I think we had this collective inflection point when, when the pandemic happened and you saw a lot of people want to move towards more meaning and purpose. And I think that's a trend that's not going to go away because, you know, when we look at the broad shifts our workplaces are going through, you know, the big one that we can't deny is that, you know, AI, AI and machine learning and automation, it's going to take away some of the monotonous tasks, which can be a great thing because it means that workers in general are going to want to have more meaning and purpose in in the work that they do. And they're going to really become kind of creators and curators of of things rather than kind of moving objects from point A A to point B. And, And I think this big shift in the workplace is going to require is going to require employees as well to think about this element of meaning and purpose and it's not just a a, a fluffy concept that that you know not is just only a slogan for a <laughs> flew. yeah exactly so that's i think where it came from but also realizing that for women in particular that that sometimes they get to a place in their career where it's like i don't all, you know and this is in everyone but they don't want to just play the game that they want to write their own rules they want to redefine the game and so this idea of like as an individual how can you define what success is on your own terms and there's a lot of power that comes from from that as well i think that more and more women are asking themselves this question because success has always been something that is out there and we have never really understood it from our perspective of what success means to us Mm -hmm. Very true. That's that's so true, and I see that so commonly. Is like sometimes we grow up, especially if you're a high high achiever, you grow up like a little bit like high on external validation, whether it's from your parents, your teachers. You grow up like constantly chasing that next achievement. But then sometimes I think what happens, especially like as women move into more senior roles, there's a sense of is this actually the path? I want to be in. Whose life am I living this for? And that's like, you know, we have this tool that Uncommon, which is a, a kind of holistic look at your compass and and a compass is kind of orients you to your own North Star, which is very different 
from somebody else's. And I really believe that a recipe for for unhappiness, unhappiness is trying to live by somebody else's version of success. And so we kind of try to try to scale that back and really define what what success is for each individual. So that also brings me to this, Yolanda, what success to you? <laughs> oh, what is success to me? Yeah. Uh, that is a very good question. I think when I think of like my vision for success, it is having the time and space to do the things that that matter to me. I, I don't think I'm someone, you know, when I when I think of like, you know, my goals in my career, I don't think I'm someone who's like, I want to, you know, retire and, and do nothing. I think I will, I, I'm ultimately a very purpose driven person. I think I will always work on projects, no matter, you know, what happens with my business, what I think I will always want to be having that impact and I want to have the space and the time to choose how I spend my time, whether that's with my family, whether that's with my loved ones, whether that's taking care of my body. That to me is a success, is showing up and and having that freedom of choice as well. I think each of us need to define what success is for ourselves. Yeah. And if we don't do that, I think it's going to be hard. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's hard to definitely. live other people's dreams, right? Especially our yeah. parents' dreams, especially in Asia. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> right? Definitely. I mean, that it's so prevalent, especially with, with parents who have sacrificed a lot. I see those similarities in my upbringing and, and a lot of my friends in, in Singapore and broader Southeast Asia is that often you are living your ancestors' wildest dreams and you have this the burden on your shoulders of proving that the sacrifices, that the privileges that you have in comparison to them are worth it. And it can be really hard to untangle that from, from you know, what is making you happy, what is burning you out, what is where your personal boundaries lie as well. And so pride that I, I think also comes from making one's uh, parents, grandparents proud. And so I, I don't think that's necessarily 100% a bad thing, but finding that, that boundary between the two, I think is important. Yeah, that that's really so true. Because otherwise, you you have all your ancestors' <laughs> dreams on your shoulder. Yeah. That's a really heavy exactly. Burden. I know. That's a really heavy, heavy know. load, right? Yeah. yeah, definitely. I always tell my parents, and and they've been incredibly supportive of me, even when I've taken some pretty crazy career turns. They're inc they're incredibly supportive. But I always tell them that like the playbook, you know, for my parents, they were optimizing for stability. You know, they both came from very poor families, they were in a new country. All they wanted was stability. And I always tell them that the playbook that took from point A to point B is very different than the playbook is going to take me from point B to point C. And and I think that they understand that and they're incredibly supportive in my, my somewhat riskier takes in my career as well. <laughs> So this is what was so interesting to look at because I, I know that you worked at a number of tech companies in your career and then you decided yeah. to come out on your own to, well, not really on your own, but actually come out and be an entrepreneur. So how did your parents process or understand that? Like you were having this great career, great career trajectory. Yeah. That's a good question. I think they trust me, ultimately. I think that there were some questions around it. Yeah, there were definitely, there were definitely questions of like, how are you going to live? <laughs> and, and stuff like that, especially in the beginning. But they, I think my parents would have loved to be entrepreneurs. I think that they have that that knack actually and they're very much I think I get a lot of like my creative ideas my resourcefulness from them so from my parents standpoint I think it was actually okay from my own standpoint I think it, it took a lot longer why I think, why because I think that you don't realize how much or at least for myself I didn't realize how much of my identity is tied to my job 
into what I do. And especially when you're starting out and nobody like, you know, heard of what you're doing, you get so many people telling you that your idea won't work, that you're going to be out of business, that you should, we're going into a recession, you'll have no money. You have so many people telling you this messaging that, that it was hard in the beginning. I remember thinking that, you know, will anyone, does anyone, do I matter anymore? Does anyone care to hear what I have to say if I'm not part of these big successful companies? And it took me some time to like actually feel confident in me, Yolanda's abilities versus kind of the brands and the and the companies that that I worked for. And that it can be incredibly daunting because so many people think will tell you that it yeah that what you're doing is wrong <laughs> and that it can't be done. And that, that, yeah. And, and so I think it was more myself. And actually my parents were incredibly supportive of me like through that period. Well, so I thought it was somehow, you know, the other way around, but actually it is a lot of it is <laughs> internal work. Yeah, definitely. It always is the final frontier. <laughs> so th is this what we were talking about when we were talking about walking with fear? Was that part of it? <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's like you get those, it's not just fear, but like your internal monologue can sometimes be quite critical and quite fearful and and learning to ignore it or, or be like, I hear you. I know you're trying to keep me safe, but, but I'm still going to move outside of my comfort zone. You know, when we talked about walking with fear, it's this element of sometimes we think that because we're afraid of something that we shouldn't do it, but actually, you know, the, the litmus test for, for the fact that you're in, in a space of growth is that there's a little bit of fear, is that there's this discomfort. And I've always thought about my, my career and I'm constantly trying to expand the zones of the, the perimeter of my, my comfort zone. And I, ha I feel like that's something I've done, I've had the opportunity to do quite easily. Like I moved, I moved to West Africa when I was like 25 and knew no one and was setting up a, you know, now, now the largest e-commerce business in, in, on the continent, but, but I had no idea what I was doing. And, and it was, I knew nobody and I knew, didn't know anything about leading a team. I didn't know anything about the market, but I think that now I feel quite comfortable going there. I feel quite comfortable owning a PNL. I feel comfortable leading a team. And I, I never would have gotten there had it not been for not listening to that voice in my head, which was like, you're going to fail. Or who do you think you are? The audacity to, to go and do these things outside of your comfort zone. And I think sometimes we all have this internal critic and learning how to see it and, and minimize it. But in a way, it, it sometimes exists to keep you safe, but how to kind of not be governed by it is something I think I've worked a lot on. Yeah, that's a really good point. You're doing it in spite of fear. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So take me back to the time that you started Uncommon and how do you pitch that first woman to join you to be in Uncommon? Yeah, I I was lucky because I was running these, but by the time we launched, I had been running these dinners for two years. I had, I would host them starting in, in 2019. And I, so I had met all of these incredible women and what was really uncommon about the Uncommon Dinner was that it was a space between the home and work where we could talk about these subjects that impact everyone in some way, but that they don't, they don't get the airtime. So we would host them on things like female competition or power or, or family. And it was really this confidential space to really connect with people and, and see, you know, how much we actually all have in common. And, and I think that that, having this really unique space was was something that made it quite easy actually in the beginning to to talk to women who were feeling incredibly lonely in their careers in their home lives and and to talk to them about actually we're going to find other women who are just like you and rather than you having to navigate 
this thing called life and this this career of yours alone, we want to find people who are really relevant to you and want you to, to have a sounding board and a place to kind of develop towards towards who who you want to be. And so in those early days, it, you know, we, we spent nothing on marketing. It all came through A, some friends who just took a leap of faith with me and B, just people who had been coming to their dinners for quite some time as well. Do you still organize those dinners? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that because I, you know, now have a team. My role has changed a lot in the in the almost two years we've been running. You know, now I deal a lot with investors, and but just uh, not this week, but last week I hosted a dinner on power and influence, and I hadn't hosted a dinner in, in such a long time, and it was so nourishing and wonderful to come back to the roots of the community. We had eight incredible women. I, I learned so even though I've hosted on this subject multiple times, it's different every time depending who's in the room. My favorite quote from it was somebody, you know, who's a senior leader at a tech firm who was like, I'm not gonna make myself small anymore. I I was always worried about shining too bright as that makes other people uncomfortable. And he had the great phrase of saying like maybe everybody else just needs to wear sunglasses. <laughs> it's not that I'm shining too bright, it's just that you need sunglasses. And, uh, and I, you know, that stayed with me. And I think it, it, it is always like so wonderful to come back and host these. And we, we do still have them in the community every month. Wow, that's really stepping into your power. <laughs> yeah, yeah, shine bright. Yeah. <laughs> but are, are you planning to host more of these dinners? and you know private get-togethers yeah we do as a community we even have members host some of them as well it is really like the core of what uncommon stood for and it's something i think is really important for us to keep up even as we grow as well so our, our next one i'm not sure i remember what so i think it might be on female competition and the roots of that so usually each uh, get together will have a topic and you will all talk yeah. about that topic. Yeah, and, and we really have it quite structured in a way. Like I give people, I bring pens and paper because sometimes I'm someone who can actually think as I speak, which is, you know, what I'm doing right now. But, uh, but I recognize, you know, sometimes people need a little bit of reflection time. So it is pretty facilitated. So we want to give introverts that space as well to, to, to speak. So we'll, give, we'll have a couple of prompt questions about the subject to delve a little bit deeper you know everyone will kind of jot down their ideas and we'll go around in this very confidential respectful way where everybody can, has a couple of minutes to really be seen and heard about you know the subject and how it impacts them how you know their philosophy behind it and so yeah that that is something that we consistently do in the community as well yeah, it sounds like a wonderful way to spend an evening because yeah, you, you well, get to talk to, I mean, you also get to meet other women, right? Yeah, that you've exactly. Never met before. And, or have you, and you really have to be familiar. <laughs> familiar no, it's people. actually, it works better actually, I think when people don't know each other because there's a level, you know, we go through certain agreements of confidentiality, which we take very seriously in the community of mutual respect, of embracing difference with curiosity generally like no advice giving so it really is a space for you know people to to yeah be see, seen and heard but not necessarily like okay well you need to do x y and z <laughs> you know um, <laughs> that's homework so, yeah exactly so so yeah and what i see is actually people form connections on that and that is you know for me the philosophy we have about building connection not just about networking i was someone who hated going to a really transactional networking event with a stack of business cards and saying, you know, assessing the room and, and everybody assessing you. What can you do for me? What can I do for you? And that to me is like not how you build real connection. And it's, I think real connection is what actually helps you, which helps people think when an opportunity comes up. And so in the early days on Common, we had a no business card policy. We wanted people to really find that that common ground and from there have the opportunity to then support each other and, 
and network and, and stuff like that. I remember I saw there was, I think, was it a webinar on your website that talked about networking, but not in the usual way? Or how do we yeah. frame networking? I think if I remember it correctly. So yeah, yeah I, I believe too that you shouldn't just go in with a transactional mindset. It just ruins yeah. the whole process, right? Of meeting yeah. people. Definitely. I, I, you know, one of our core pillars at Uncommon is generosity. And that's something I think about, like, even the way that I network well is more that I can give actually, like, I receive, like, tech. One of the things I like to ask is, what's a day in the life of Yolanda Lee like at Uncommon? <laughs> it varies so much as a founder, but I'm generally a pretty early riser. My body, even on a weekend, wakes me up pretty early. So I'm not very good at sleeping in, unfortunately. <laughs> but I don't believe in the kind of like hustle, burnout, get no sleep. I know that my brain, my decision making, my capacity to handle the stress of the job is much better when I get a solid amount of sleep. So I generally wake up in the morning. I'm actually someone, part of what I like about waking up early, so whether it's like 6.37, is I, I actually love a slow start to the morning because I know that, you know, once work starts, it's going to be quite intense. I love, you know, just drinking some tea, meditating, doing a little bit of exercise first thing in the morning. I think having that practice really helps kind of set me up for, for the rest of the day. I, do I always manage it? Absolutely not. <laughs> but but it is, especially on days where I work from home, like I really try to get in a yoga session or something first, first thing in the morning. Generally, like my days, I batch my week actually. So I have days when I take all of my internal meetings, unblock things with the team, catch up with my department heads, all, all of that. Then I have days when I take external, external meetings. So it might be meetings with investors, meetings with corporates that we might be working with, external meetings that, yeah, that I meet with people as potential partners for the business as well. I actually, I have a no meeting Wednesday. It doesn't it's not always live up to its uh, intention, but I have a no meeting Wednesday when I try to get all my desk work done. If I owe someone a, a projection or um, you know, need to craft something for the team. I think sometimes as a founder, it's very easy to get pulled into the weeds and having that time to like pull myself out, think about the big picture, the strategy is really, really key as well. And yeah, and then the other days of the week are kind of a little bit more free flow depending on what's, what's on my plate. Work can, it, it, it can, I, I don't, I wouldn't say I work super late every day. I definitely try to nourish myself in, in the ways that, you know, having a startup is both a, a, a marathon and a sprint. So, so things like eating well are really important to me. Getting some exercise in daily is really important to me as well. And also like seeing some of my closest friends, that's, that is, is something that's really valuable to me as well. So usually if I do have work to do late, I will sometimes take a break, have dinner, regroup a little bit, and then finish it off after. I, I'm not someone who who works well when I'm hangry, <laughs> I'll say. In general, I like to break, like work from, from getting ready for, for bed and, and winding down somehow. So I will read my book. I love fiction. I mean, yeah fantastic book which is like the feminist retelling of the hindu epic ramayana it's all told from the perspective of the sort of vilified queen named kaikeyi and it's a fantastic novel so i love kind of escaping by reading as well listening to a podcast and then i i go to bed pretty early when i can to get that solid sleep in it sounds like a pretty healthy and good lifestyle I am. <laughs> I try, I try. It doesn't always uh, work out that way. But to me, like, I think there are certain pillars that I need to have in order to really thrive. Again, coming back to like, just that cognitive performance, that ability to make the right decisions, to handle the inevitable like fires that you sometimes have to put out. And so things like getting good sleep, eating well, exercising, spending some time, whether that's like meditating or just some time being calm without distractions. 
that to me are like the pillars that enable me to take on a lot of the work and the stress that sometimes comes with with being a startup founder as well. And now that you've been a startup founder for a while, is there any piece of advice you offer to other women who are intending to start something on their own? Oh, I can say that my advice comes from like a learning for my for myself. I think I would always look at people, you know, quitting their jobs, starting a business, and only see that tip of the iceberg. And I would think. Oh gosh, they're so brave to do that, and I could never take that leap. But from my own experience, like with building on common, there's a lot of ways that you can de-risk that jump. Sometimes people want to like build a whole product and put all this money into it and quit their job, and and that can be really daunting. And I think for me, like you know, running the dinners for some time, you know. Sitting on on different kind of focus committees or organizing it up to validate it within myself of like is this something that I want to commit the next like all my waking hours to <laughs> for the next who knows however many years because I think like sometimes businesses you know don't work out because people just kind of burn out or they lose interest or and I think it is really important. Especially on the tough days, to have that higher, you know, purpose or that that piece that really drives you, because there are days where you're like you are going to hate your job, and and so really de-risking it and making sure that like this is this is what you want to be working on, and and then from that kind of having something that really drives you forward in it, I think that that has really served me well. That's really good advice because I think a lot of people want to quit their job and jump into the business that they're starting, and, yeah. and people feel that they're so bold. I personally feel that yes, that's a lot of preparation that you need to do before you actually get to the point where you throw in your resignation letter. Yeah, for sure. For me, it was also like, how do I feel safe and taking on this risk? You know, I had very clear goals of like how much money I wanted to have saved. You know, had a full like budget for myself for the first year, and and also like a cutoff where I was like, okay, if the business isn't at this milestone in this time, you know, I'll go back and and get a corporate job. And luckily, we we hit those milestones and surpassed them. But but I think also knowing like your own your own limits because yeah, there were definitely days where I'm like, I miss my tech. Tech salary, <laughs> or something. I miss the cushiness of working in a in a you know well-funded tech company. So yeah, but but I think that 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 initial you know stress wears off pretty quickly, and and it's amazing to see something that you you know ideated on on the back of a napkin come to life. And it's sometimes so easy to be looking ahead. At, okay, what's the next goal? What's the next fundraise? Who's the next hire I'm making? And every now and then, I'll just like stop. I'll be walking down the street and be like, I can't believe! I genuinely can't believe I am running this business. That I have a team. That we have hundreds of members. That yeah, we're we're speaking to these huge like VCs. It's like wow, I can't believe that this came to life. And and just to take stock of those milestones, I think is really really important. Yeah, and to have a little celebration every now and then. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Always celebrate your wins, even the smallest wins. Celebrate them fully and do so with with your teams as well. Were you bootstrapped, or did you get funding for your business? In the beginning, we were bootstrapped. We were funded by my savings, which was. Kind of stressful in the beginning, but but yeah, then we found like a couple of we actually had like a female angel investor come to us and say, "Hey, I want to invest in you," and、uh, and so that was great, and and we had a little bit of angel investment, and then we ran for a year without anything else, and then and then joined Iterative, the startup accelerator, a year after we had actually turned them down. Pre-launch because we wanted that space to figure out the business and not have as much kind of pressure to to kind of grow, grow, grow in in the beginning as well. That's good to know that you hit some milestones and you know now people are knocking on your door 
and you're yeah. getting the attention that you really need for your business. So let's talk a little bit about Yolanda growing up. I wanted to get that okay. in, get it in. How were your childhood years like? Oh, oh, I hope my parents don't listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, they were interesting. They were interesting in the way that, in some ways, I had an incredibly. I, I'm very grateful for, to my parents for giving me exposure to very different, very different roles, and I think I, I. They're very different worlds in in a way. So I, my parents, as I mentioned, were incredibly focused on education. And in Canada, had really had a vision for us going to the best schools. And in Canada, uh, it was tended to be uh, private schools. And we were really from a, a modest background. And, and so a lot of resources went into going to these exceptional schools. And, and I think that I was at the time, it was really challenging because, you know, I went to that immense privilege and I'm grateful for that because it taught me to navigate a world that was very different from the world that I lived in. But at the time it was really hard because you're always wondering like, well, why don't we have that? Or why can't we go on these vacations? Or why don't we have a second home somewhere? And so I think I, I grew up like a little bit feeling quite insecure about my background. Also being like a kid of immigrants in Canada, there were very few people of color in my school. And I think I had a lot of insecurities around that, being a minority in, in, in the schools as well. But I, now I look back on it and it made me who I am today. I think I'm someone who can connect with people from all walks of life. And, you know, I think it was growing up with that juxtaposition of my, my family who were very, very in class and then going to school in these very elite, elite circles that I learned sort of how to adapt and find ways to connect with people. And so that was was something that defined my childhood in a, in a lot of ways and, and took a lot, a lot of time, I think, to become actually quite proud of where I come from. I think it, I used to feel a lot of shame and embarrassment in the car my parents drove or uh, you know, in comparison to kids at my school who would get Range Rovers for their, their 16th birthday. But I now I, I learned how to reframe that in a big way and see, wow, it's so incredible. The things I've achieved, the places I've been coming from where I came from. And, and it's something I now speak about with like such a sense of pride and gratitude to my parents for giving me those opportunities and to myself for also taking them and and running with them. I'm sure your parents would love to hear this part because I think <laughs> I, I, I think at the end, I mean, you really are grateful for your experiences. Yeah, you know, yeah. Back I think they look back. Probably be like, <laughs> I mean, you look. Cool, yeah, you know? back then, I, I, yeah, it's hard to make sense of it when you're like 13 and you're like, yeah. why don't I have this? And now <laughs> I say, I, I feel like I, I, I'm actually cringe at like the the level of entitlement, but. I think I learned learned to have a little bit of perspective as well. Yeah. I'm glad I'm glad that made you who you are. Otherwise, I don't think you'll be in Singapore. I don't think you'll be starting uncommon or you know doing all the stuff that you were doing in your job in your career. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, so I am incredibly grateful for, it. and I think also living in so many different places from you know different parts of Africa to Europe studying in the UK I think that adaptiveness is something that's like really served me well but it's also helped me see that like at the core humans humans men women any genders like we ultimately all have very similar needs we want to be seen and heard we want to feel safe we want to feel like we belong that is something I see, I think is universal. And so, so I'm, I'm very grateful for, for being able to, to have that perspective through my life. And can I ask some really non, not so serious questions now? Sure, yeah. <laughs> What's the craziest thing you've ever done? 
Ooh, off the record. I might, that, that one we have to say off the record. Oh, I mean, I, I, I had an experience. I did go to jail in Ghana where I was working there. It was a bit of a, an altercation. At the time I was like running a food delivery startup there. I was MD of a company called Jumia Food and had an altercation with a taxi driver who then got into a fight with one of our delivery riders. I and mean, then the taxi driver brought this kind of corrupt police officer to the office who probably thought he could like make some money off of a, a foreigner. And uh, yeah, got taken to a, a jail there and miraculously realized the power of relationships. I ended up like, kind of calling someone or my team ended up calling someone who knew someone who knew someone who ended up getting me out. <laughs> yeah, bailing me out. But yeah, always, always keep your, it's, it's something, yeah, I definitely think like having the right relationships can get you out of unfair situations as well. Wow, that's wild. That's the first, yeah. <laughs> the first on my podcast that people say such a wild yeah. thing. I mean, some, sometimes people say wild things, but this is the wildest I've heard for a while. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't think I told my parents that one, so if they do listen to this, sorry, <laughs> mom and dad. <laughs> what about an unusual habit or a surprising habit that people don't know about you? Ooh, so I quit drinking coffee when we were in the middle of an accelerator, which mostly came out of me getting a stomach bug, but I thought I, I could quit my, at the time, probably three or four a day coffee habit. That was the most challenging month of my life. Timing wise, probably didn't make the most sense, but maybe not of my life, by the way, but it was a <laughs> challenging month. And but from that, you know, it, it worked wonders for me. My sleep improved, my anxiety improved. And now I drink what I think of is almost mud water, which is <laughs> this kind of superfood drink I drink every morning, which is not coffee, but it still gives me energy. And it's sort of a healthy hot chocolate. It's like raw ca cacao powder. It's got some cinnamon. Sometimes I put this like kind of superfood powder together every morning and with a little bit of like hot milk. And, and I drink that every morning. And it's like my, my coffee alternative that, uh, that I love that sometimes looks a bit strange, but really looks like mud water. <laughs> and that is what I have swapped. And sometimes I think about like bottling it and selling it as a side business because it is a really wonderful energizer in the morning. <laughs> but how does it taste? Does it taste good? It tastes like a like a not so sweet hot chocolate. Sometimes in Southeast Asia, I find the palate quite sweet, but I don't put any sugar in it. So it's like a bitter, you can imagine dark chocolate no sugar and a little bit of spices and I me personally I love it and some other people I've given it to love it but I think if you have a sweeter palate you might not love it okay yeah. and what about personal goal that you're most focused on for this year oh good question I think I I, I mean speaking candidly I I came out of like a really long-term relationship. I was engaged to be married, came out of that in 2021. And, you know, it was really like a, a challenging decision to make, but really the right one for me. And, and, you know, this year, I think it's been really like learning to be comfortable with myself. And that has been something I think I've worked a lot on. And I, I've turned a corner of like, I just, love love doing things alone the other day i went to the cinema alone i went to bali alone and i think there's a side of me that like is really reconnecting with all of all of my like deeper passions and that's been it's been great to kind of get to that place and i want to keep exploring that this year yeah and what are you no longer afraid of oh uh, i mean yeah, to, to, to go off of that subject, like the first thing that came to mind was I'm no longer afraid of being alone. I, I really feel feel in a, in a place of empowerment and strength with myself. And before we come to the other final question, is there anything that I should have asked you but didn't? Or something that you want to get off your chest? <laughs> oh, yeah. 
I'm trying to think anything off my chest. I would, oh, I would say that as much as I'm common as a business and I'm very focused on, you know, enabling fem female leaders to have a safe space to unpack some of their biggest challenges. I, I really believe like that, that female liberation is male liberation. I'm actually very fat. I grew up with three brothers. I'm very fascinated about the ways in which we can put men in a box in the ways that men you know don't have the space to uh, express themselves don't are sort of policed in the ways that they can't show any emotion other than anger so i i as a bigger yeah a bigger piece of the puzzle like i i think we also as, as a society need to kind of take care of of men and really think about what modern masculinity means and it's definitely something i I think a lot about, I talk a lot about to my male friends, my male mentors, and yeah, and I think that's a bigger vision for for a world that works really well together. We've, we've got to look at both sides of that coin. Yeah. Is that where Uncommon is headed next? I can't say too much about <laughs> that, but I, I will say there's a reason I kept the name gender neutral and that we used to run like some sessions. We ran an imposter syndrome ses session with men and it was fascinating actually to see yeah, how, how men struggle with a lot of these challenges as well and probably have less spaces to really talk about some of those those challenges, the, the pressures of being a man as well. And so I would love one day to also yeah, explore those subjects. So this has been such a fascinating interview. <laughs> I learned so much about not just about you, but about the reasons why you started and how you went from corporate to starting your own startup and running it and managing it and doing all those things that you do. So final question, where can people find you online if they want to connect with you? Yeah, so if they want to connect with me, they can go to our Uncommon pages. So we are at Hey Uncommon on Instagram. So we're pretty active there and probably most active on, on LinkedIn. So this is Uncommon. Otherwise they can go to our website heyuncommon.com to find out more info about what we do. So thank you, Yolanda. I am so glad I spoke to you because I think that what you're doing is also keeping things authentic, keeping things real. Uh, because I, I also feel sometimes that, you know, networking for networking's sake isn't going to cut it for a lot of us. No. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female. You know, we just need to have real deep connections and I think that is what we, we should all be moving towards whether we're in business or not yeah definitely thank you so much Krista it, it's been such a wonderful nourishing conversation and I really appreciate you having me here today thank you so much we'll definitely see you again see you soon bye, bye. and that's a wrap I learned so much from Yolanda too, but the biggest takeaway is to de-risk the entrepreneurial venture, especially if you are ready to move from corporate to entrepreneurship. Here's something that I want to share with you. Many of my guests tell me that being on my podcast has helped them understand who they are after all these years and makes them appreciate themselves more through the questions that make them feel seen and heard and human. There's really no secret. I really do love being inspired by my guests and I go into every conversation feeling like I'm about to uncover the world's greatest surprise. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, please subscribe to the podcast and share this episode with a friend. And of course, find all the show notes and more on womenpreneurasia.com. It's been a pleasure having you here with me today and I will see you next Friday.